Hey Wargamers, we are finally in it now. We have previews for the new Tau Codex, including some pretty massive rules changes. So the first thing that we get to talk about today is the new detachment that was previewed, the Retaliation Cadre. Now, this is one of six new detachments or six total detachments that will be in the Codex. We already know what a few of them are going to be. Of course, Cal Yun will be maintained. Uh, there is very likely going to be a Crude Hunting Pack detachment. And then we have this, the Retaliation Cadre, uh, plus probably three more, right? So that gives us a total of six. Now, the thing about the Retaliation Cadre is that it is focused on battle suits, and it has the Bonded Heroes Detachment Rule. Basically says that with your when you're within 12 inches uh, firing a Tau Empire battle suit unit, uh, that shot gets plus one strength, and if you're within six inches, it gets uh, plus one AP. So if you're within six inches of your target, you get plus one strength, plus one AP, a massive benefit to pretty much anything that you're going to be shooting at. Uh, that is going to be super, super helpful. Um, and it seems like very clearly this is favoring a close up and personal approach, right? A very aggressive type of play. And so it does seem very much like this might be in lieu of Monka as a detachment. Maybe not. Maybe there's going to be a more generalist Monka detachment. We don't know. Uh, but that is worth considering. This certainly is the more farsight minded, uh, minded detachment out of the new codex. Not necessarily the only Montca strategy though. So we'll take a look, you know, of course, we'll see what comes with the new codex, but this is definitely going to be a very close range fighting detachment for this very good benefit. Uh, Bonded Heroes itself is probably better than the old Montca ability. It's not limited to um, a certain portion of the game, right? The old Monka uh, Philosophy of War ability used to uh, be limited to the first three turns. No longer the case. This is for the entirety of the game. Uh, it is only restricted to battle suits, which is a drawback, of course, but uh, it's for the entirety of the game, and it doesn't require you to shoot at the closest unit. Although, if you have multiple units within six inches uh, or 12 inches, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe that does uh, bring some issues. So, uh, I think this is definitely a step up from the old Monka ability, especially if you're looking to bring battle suits, which most of us are. Um, the biggest impact of this rule, though, is for those high volume of fire weapons. So your flame or your burst cannons, those are going to see the biggest step up. Uh, you know, when I saw this, of course, I was thinking about stealth suits getting a really big bump from this because, you know, being uh, stealth suits are going to have the, a good opportunity to position. They're going to have a good opportunity to drop homing beacons. They're going to be able to be aggressive. Uh, because of things like infiltrator so maybe we see a lot of benefit for this for stealth suits but also other weapon types uh, like the cyclic ion blaster and the airburst fragmentation projector are going to get a really substantial boost on this because it's going to push them across some pretty major thresholds right going from strength four to strength five from five to six no ap to, to one ap that means a lot right that makes a really big difference to how well those weapons perform across a variety of targets other things like missile pods, plasma, fusion, they all get pushed across some important thresholds too, right? Going from strength 7 to 8 um, or 9 to 10, right? Like we're seeing some pretty big, uh, big numbers there. A lot of targets aren't going to be necessarily sensitive to those changes, but some of them will be, right? If you're going from strength 7 to strength 8, that is a big uh, leg up against things that are toughness uh, four, for example, right? You're you're getting to that that critical twice the toughness threshold. Or if you are moving from strength nine to strength ten with fusion, then all of a sudden you're able to you know more effectively wound things that are you know up to toughness twenty, uh, or you know have an even better time uh, harming things that are toughness five, for example, right? Again, you're getting to that 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 doubling of their toughness. So you do cross some critical thresholds for those bigger weapons as well. Uh, it's just not proportionally necessarily going to be as impactful. All around though, a fantastic benefit. Uh, one that you will certainly want to utilize as much as you can within reason. Now, of course, with each detachment, we are getting new stratagems, or at least stratagems for each detachment. And for the retaliation cadre, we got two previewed for us today. Uh, the first is a shortened blade. That's two CP uh, and allows you to deep strike 
up to three inches away from enemy models. So you have to be at least three inches away horizontally. It doesn't specify vertically, which is an interesting point. Uh, but you can get up to three inches away during your deep strike, which is uh, really, really useful, right? Especially for your battle suit units, which this is restricted to, uh, that's going to do a lot in order to trigger that uh, bonded hero's special ability, right? So you're able to deep strike with confidence, right? You're going to get in there, you're going to get nice and close, you're going to be, you know, up, you know, if you're within, you know, four inches, right? That's that's getting both plus one strength, plus one AP on your hits. So you're getting a ton of damage output potentially by dropping in a nice juicy unit of crisis suits into, um, you know, into the heart of an opponent's line, right? So you're potentially getting a lot of really good targets, a lot of really high damage output because of this. Essentially, this is a homing beacon stratagem, which maybe doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but does have a lot going for it in the way that it's faster, right? You don't need to uh, position stealth suits. You don't need to get stealth suits into the right spot, which can be harder than it seems, right? Especially if those stealth suits are being shot at. <laughs> um, you, you don't have to worry about that here, right? So there's a lot of value just in that. Um, it is 2 CP, which is expensive, of course, but if you're only bringing in, you know, a couple units, a whole game using this, I think that's probably a justified expense. Um, the homing beacon is still available, of course, uh, at least as far as we know. <laughs> uh, and if you have the homing beacon, that means that you have this kind of backup in case you don't have the CP or, you know, if you want an alternative that doesn't require CP or you're looking to run stealth anyway, you know, all sorts of reasons why you still might want to consider uh, a homing beacon and not just rely on this. So um, plenty of really advantageous things still about homing beacons, but if you're looking for like the, you know, the turn to deep strike nice nice and close um the shortened blade is definitely going to be the way to go and that basically screams farsight bomb right like farsight bomb is going to want to be using this as much as possible we still have to see what uh what unit sizes look like and everything like that what farsight himself looks like of course that's going to be uh interesting in the new codex but uh as far as we know this is going to be a massive uh mechanism that running Farsight Bombs is going to align very strongly with. The other stratagem that we had previewed is the Torch Star Gambit. Great name. Uh, it's essentially strike and fade, but one CP, right? The the wording here is exactly the same. In your shooting phase, pick a battle suit unit that can fly. Uh, when their attacks are resolved, they can move again, right? They can move after they, after they do that. It's jump, shoot, jump. Uh, one CP is a much better price point than 2CP here, so that's great. Uh, massive utility. Uh, the pricing here is thematic too because it just kind of leans into the idea of this being a battle suit detachment and one that probably is going to have an easier time or would you know justifiably utilize this type of tactic more readily than perhaps the Kaoyan one. So uh, that's cool. Uh, at 1 CP, you can't complain. Uh, is You're going to want to use it basically every turn, basically regardless, right? It facilitates so many different things. It allows you to get close to use your uh, bonded heroes bonus. It allows you to grab objectives. It allows you to, you know, dash behind line of sight blocking terrain, all sorts of stuff. And it's cheap enough that you're going to want to use this every turn. And if you're not, you better have a really good reason not to right? Like it just is one of those things that you're going to want to do because this game is so much about movement. Having this at 1 CP is going to be a huge boon to many different types of play styles. Now let's get into probably the most controversial thing that we got in this preview, and that is that crisis suits as a unit are dead. They do not exist. That is not a thing anymore. Now we have three different types of crisis suit units. There are now three units. We have the Fire Knife unit, the Sunforge unit, the Star Scythe unit. Those are three different units. There is no such thing as just the standard Crisis Suit unit any longer. Um, and what these things do is basically restrict 
the types of weapons, the types of loadouts that crisis suits can take. Um, and it has all sorts of associated perks with that each. So the star scythe loadout is flamers and burst cannons. The fire knife is missiles and plasma. Uh, the sunforge is twin fusion. Now, those different themes uh, are not specifically rigid loadouts, right? In the, in the preview, they discuss it as allowing people to pick from a, you know, from a buffet of these different weapons, right? And what I interpret that to mean is that, you know, for Star Scythe, for example, you have to pick Flamers and Burst Cannon, but maybe you can pick three Flamers. Maybe you can pick three Burst Cannons. Maybe you can pick two and one or one and two or whatever, right? Um, you have flexibility within those limited weapon options, but you are not beholden to a specific loadout, right? You are not beholden to one flamer and two bursts, for example, for Star Scythe. You have some flexibility there. Um, so that's worth noting. Um, the old Crisis data sheet, go into Legends, right? Like I said, it's not a thing anymore. Uh, and and so if you want to use the old Crisis suits where you can load it up with whatever you want, uh, you're going to need to use Legends, which means you're probably not going to be able to play in tournaments or any type of organized events. Uh, but you can certainly do that in your basement, in your garage, playing with buddies, right? That's totally something you can still do if everyone agrees. Um, this does raise an interesting question in lieu of uh, my previous video talking about how we're going to have three, four units going to Legends now because of the difference in the data cards. Now we actually have more units coming than we thought, and so that means at least a couple more units are going to be heading to Legends as well. Um, and that probably is going to be the Tide Wall, is my guess, right? So I, th I think if because we're getting these additional units of Crisis Suits, new data cards, new data sheets for these Crisis Suit units. We're going to have to compensate for that in some way, and it's going to mean the tide wall uh, fortifications are probably going to go uh, the way of the dodo, or rather the the way of the legend, right? So that's my guess there. But overall, though, this transition from one one kind of massive data sheet to three much more focused ones seems like a really good pivot to allow more flavorful gameplay. You can have loadout specific special rules, which we'll talk about in a second. You have the opportunity for each one of these to have a very specific niche, a very specific niche, uh, <laughs> right? You have your opportunity for these things to really shine as their own independent units. You know, people always have been asking, you know, they always ask for more and more battle suits. People want more battle suits. Well, here you're getting different battle suits. They're just using an existing kit. Right, you you're getting new battle suits, you're getting new gameplay options. It's just using the same model, and for me, that's great because it means I don't have to buy something new. I get to use the things that I already have, and I get a whole bunch of new options built into that. That's from a consumer standpoint, I think that's awesome. Um, it also means because of the way that tenth edition works with the rule of three. Now we're not limited to just three units of crisis suits that if we really want to, we could bring nine units of crisis suits and who knows about the points limitations and, you know, unit sizes and all that, but nine units of crisis suits could be a list that you could bring if the points and everything work out. So that's pretty awesome, right? That it really does open up an uh, entire crisis suit army as something that is, you know, much more much more valid or much more reasonable than it would have been under the single data sheet option because in that earlier version you would just have like you know a couple data sheets in your entire army this just feels better to have multiple data sheets that are tailored that are specific for different roles that just seems like more of an army and less of a you know less spammy less um of you know, more of just a really big unit as opposed to a multifaceted comprehensive army. So one of these three units is the Sunforge loadout, right? One of the three new crisis suits is a unit that is focused strictly on fusion blasters. And that's a little bit different, right? Because, you know, before we, we have, uh, you know, plasma and missile and we have fusion or excuse me burst cans and flamers and and so there is that flexibility there but with the sunforge it's fusion all day all night 24 7 365 right twin fusion blasters are what you can take and so they say that these are 
twin fusion blasters, not twin linked fusion blasters, right? Which would normally be how having two fusion blasters would be modeled. Um, and so it's unclear if, if that's a typo or if this is really something different. If it is twin fusion blasters, it's probably a new weapon that just has two shots, right? So strength nine, AP minus four, D6 plus two damage, melt a keyword, two shots. That seems pretty reasonable. Um, and then if you're benefiting from bonded, you're at you know strength 10 minus four AP within six inches. Also pretty awesome, right? Now, the Sunforge unit, and all, each of these three crisis suit units has their own special role because every unit in uh, 10th edition 40K has something special about them, right? And here for the Sunforge crisis suits, uh, you get to reroll wounds um, and damage rolls against monsters or vehicles if you're using the Sunforge loadout, which seems pretty good if you're trying to you know use fusion blasters. You're probably firing at some monsters. You're probably firing at some vehicles. So that's a pretty nice benefit, um, and that does buffer very strongly against having a limited number of shots, which you know whether you, these are twin linked, whether these are you know two shots or one shot you're going to have a limited number of shots. And so having those rerolls is really going to make these uh, these units go as far as they can, which is great. Um, the fact that you reroll wounds and damage does to me suggest that it's a twin fusion blaster, not a twin linked fusion blaster, because the reroll to wound would be redundant with, with uh, the twin link benefits, right? So uh, it does seem like this really is going to be something different, that you're going to get two shots, and it's going to, you know, pump out a lot of damage. I expect this to be, you know, one of the best anti-tank options in the Codex. Um, as far as the, you know, bespoke rules for Fire Knife and for Star Scythe, you know, we don't know. But my guess, based on the theme here from the Sunforge, Fire knife probably, you know, going to be something maybe like devastating wounds, right? Like that's thematic with kind of like the the punchiness of missile pods and plasma rifles having that ability to, um, you know, get through that that you know medium to heavy armor and uh, take out the those more elite infantry units. Devastating wounds would be complementary to that. For star scythe, having lethal hits against infantry. Also very similar to, the, you know, kind of on the opposite end of the Sunforge special rule, yeah? Uh, having lethal hits is, you know, going to go well with, you know, just pumping out shots and having it be focused with against infantry just makes a lot of sense for the, you know, anti-infantry weapon. So that totally fits uh, in my mind, too. And, and so hopefully we see something kind of like this or better for each of their special rules. Of course, I wouldn't scoff at... Um, one of these rules being, uh, you know, full rerolls to hit against a particular target. You know, something like that seems reasonable as well for that type of special roll. So maybe uh, the the star scythe have you know full rerolls to hit against infantry. That'd be great. Um, pretty useless against the uh, again, with the flamers, but for burst cannons, it would be useful. So, yeah. Now, of course, that leaves the question of commanders, right? And commanders in the new codex look like they are basically the same. Um, they previewed the Enforcer, they previewed the Cold Star. Both of those have exactly the same ability, so I'm not even gonna bother showing you the Cold Star. Uh, you know, it makes it makes your units faster, right? The Enforcer makes them more durable. It reduces the AP of incoming shots by one. Uh, that's what it does, that's what they do. That functionality seems to be exactly the same. Um, however, they, get some interesting changes relative to crisis suits in the way that commanders still are fully customizable. You can load them out with whatever weapons you want, any combination, and so they are fully customizable. They can match the role of the unit that they are joining, so you don't have, you know, you know, three different flavors of enforcer in the codex, right? They're, they're each their own uh, data sheet, and um, you can bring an enforcer that is kitted up to go with uh, a fire a fire knife unit. You can uh, bring an enforcer that's loaded up to go with the Sunforge unit. You can bring one that's loaded up to do the Star Scythe unit. Whatever you want, you could do that, right? And you can do that with each of the different commanders. So they're they're fully customizable. Um, 
and they have access to weapons that, importantly, crisis suits don't have, right? So they're able to bring cyclic ion, they're able to bring airburst fragmentation projectors, which previously have been available to crisis suits, no more is that the case. Now those have been moved back into commander-only weapons like they have been in uh, editions long ago, and um, this makes them, again, a little bit more special than the uh, crisis suit, which you know, wasn't the case uh, at the beginning of 10th in the index. So this gives them again a little bit more, uh, a little bit more sparkle, something to make them a little bit more intriguing in that they can be different, they can be fully customizable, and they have these loadouts that are available only to them. Um, having cyclic ion blasters and airburst fragmentation projectors be commander only, I think is a, a nice move. It's something that makes the uh, weapons available to the particular units match what's provided in the kit. Uh, not entirely, like in the case of, um, you know, if you're bringing multiples of, of certain weapons, but still, uh, you're using the weapons that are at least available on the sprue. So that matches and is really something that we were expecting, or at least I was expecting to be the case in the index. Like when the index hit and crisis suits still had access to cyclic ion blasters, I was really surprised. So I'm not surprised that we've actually bit that bullet here uh, and, and taken cyclic away from crisis suits. Um, it does mean that maybe there's opportunity for these rules to change a little bit, like for particularly for the airburst fragmentation projector, which has, you know, historically been a, a massively underperforming weapon, uh, with with very minor exceptions for brief moments of time. Um, maybe this means that because it's something that's only on the commander, maybe it has a little bit more opportunity to be buffed to actually, you know, be worth something. <laughs> if not, I would be you know really surprised if we we ever saw it used uh, in this context but but the the biggest thing here is that commanders are meant to be special their weapons are meant to be special and this goes with that in a really elegant way now overall I think all of this is actually a pretty good change I know there are benefits and costs it's not a hundred percent you know not a hundred percent great not 100% bad, but I think the net overall change is positive. Um, it allows for better pricing. Uh, one of the things that we have talked about time and time again on this channel is that the way that Tau have been historically conceptualized and uh, implemented in the rules has made balancing them very hard. Um, whether we're talking about drones, whether we're talking about uh, battle suit loadouts, Having so many options and having so many interdependent parts of the army makes it hard to price them uh, appropriately in isolation. And so by breaking these uh, different crisis units into separate data, data sheets um, and you know, isolating the uh, weapon loadouts of each of those, Games Workshop can much more accurately price them and balance them based on what they actually do and, and their potential uh, contributions to a game. So I think that just makes a ton of sense uh, from Games Workshop's perspective and in trying to balance the rule set. And I think it should be really appealing to us as players who want to have a game that can be tweaked more directly uh, and, and have changes in points, changes in rules that actually reflect how we're using these models in the game. This should facilitate that much more easily. Um, it also means that one weapon doesn't monopolize the unit, right? It means that crisis suits are not just by default trip cyclic ion blasters, right? That you have some uh, restrictions on what you're doing and those restrictions provide opportunities for other weapons to shine and actually have a place on the table, which is, again, something we've talked about time and time again, wanting to have that diversity, wanting to have that flexibility and versatility in the unit such that it there is not one clear winner. There is not one go-to choice that different weapons, different loadouts provide different utility, and therefore you can pick the loadout, you can pick the unit in this case that matches your play style and the needs of your army in a way that isn't just overwhelmed with opportunity cost for not taking 
you know, three cyclic ion blasters or whatever. Um, and so this provides a mechanism for better balance, more interesting gameplay, and something that really should be viewed, hopefully, as a positive thing. At least at this point, based on what we know, I think this is a strongly positive thing. Um, it also means that there's opportunity for these uh, special rules, for the unit-specific special rules, to be really potent, really impactful, right? By making crisis suits no longer a jack of all trades, by giving them the specific rules associated with the three different loadouts, they can give special rules that make them much more effective at those rules as well. When we were dealing with one data data sheet, you couldn't give them a special rule that was only going to benefit them in one of those roles. It just wouldn't it it just wouldn't um, you know be a cohesive uh, design strategy. But here, because we now have specialization of the unit, we get a lot more out of it. Um, and so it gives you a reason to bring uh, different units. It gives you uh, an ability that you can only get in this one loadout and therefore you get a lot more out of it. So overall, again, I think this makes crisis suits as a unit, whether you're bringing them in a more complex army or if you're bringing them as like the bulk of your army, right? If you're bringing just a retaliation cadre that is very heavily invested in crisis suits, Either way, this makes Crisis Suits much more interesting to play with, makes them more interesting to play against, and it gives you more interesting hobby elements in the way that you have these you know, much more thematic roles that they're bringing as opposed to being just a Crisis Suit with the uh, particular weapons you know, slapped on the side with magnets. It gives you a little bit more play about how you might stylize these and things like that. It's a really minor concern, but still something worth thinking about. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Am I, uh, you know, am I shill for Games Workshop here by being pumped about this or, uh, or do you agree? Let's have a conversation about it. And uh, as always, thanks for watching. Happy Wargaming. And I can't wait to see what is revealed next about this upcoming book. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you stuck around to this point in the video, maybe you want to join our Discord community as well. There's a link in the description below. Special thanks to all my supporters over on Patreon, but especially the folks that you see on your screen now. If you want to help make more invasive wargaming videos, consider joining our community over there as well.